Amen. If you have your Bible tonight, and thank you for coming, we're turning to the book of Hebrews again. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. And Hannah will be singing another piece just after uh, we preach the gospel uh, tonight. Hebrews chapter 9, uh, one verse, and then we're going over into the book of Revelation. Hebrews chapter 9, and verse 27. And take the time and find the place. And let us read the word of God together. Verse 27, it says, And it is appointed unto men once to die. But after this, the judgment. It is appointed unto men once to die. But after this, the judgment. I want you to come with me, please, to the very end of your Bible, to the book of Revelation, and to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, and to some well-known verses uh, tonight. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven, or the heavens, fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And we know the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his word. There's been many sad and solemn and sober days in the history of this world. Days that will never be forgotten. Days that many of us would never care to see played out again. But when we come into this 20th chapter of the book of Revelation, we come to the most solemn, serious, sobering, sad day, not only in time, but in eternity. Jude, in his little epistle in verse 6, he described this day as the day of great judgment. Four times the Lord Jesus describes it. Peter, in his epistle, talks about the day of judgment and perdition. And you know, if every one of us tonight that are saved really could get a grasp of the words that we have read together, we ought to tremble and shake in our very shoe to think of what we have been reading tonight is going to be the destiny of many and maybe even some in this very meeting tonight. We read in Hebrews chapter 9 that it is, as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. And I want to bring you tonight, dear friends, to the great judgment day. The Bible says that it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. You see, death is not the end. Death is but a stepping stone from time out into eternity. 
That's why David could say, there is but a step between me and death. One moment that you're in the realm of time, and the next moment you're out in the realm of eternity. The very reason that you're in this life is to prepare for the afterlife. I want you to cast your eye to the 11th verse of this chapter And I want you to see some things tonight and I want you to remember what God has to say about what happens after men and women die in their sin. In verse 11, John said, and I saw. John didn't imagine this. He didn't dream about this. This isn't something that John imagined in uh, his mind, not something that he concocted some night when he had nothing to do. This is something that John saw. And you know, dear unsaved in the meeting tonight, if you die in your sin, if you die the way that you are now, unsaved, unconverted, you'll not only see this, but you'll be here. You'll be here. He said, I saw a great White throne. 35 times in this book of Revelation, John said, I saw. In the first verse of Revelation, chapter 1, this is what it said. It's a revelation which God gave to show things which must shortly come to pass. And this scene that we're going to see tonight, and with the help of God, we're going to bring you, and we're going to gaze for a moment upon it. This is something that will not just, it might happen, or it could happen, it will happen. Not because John said it, or not even because I said it, but because God said it. Things that must shortly come to pass. This is not a prediction of a man. This is a promise from God. Cast your eye again. It says, and I saw a great white throne. I want you to see for a moment tonight the vision of this throne. I want you to get in your mind's eye and I want you to try to imagine, although none of us will be able to do it, uh, do it justice, but I want you to try to imagine what this great throne will be like. And I must confess, as I've been meditating in these verses, even in the middle of the night, I've often woke and thought about this scene. I want you to see for a moment this vision of this throne and the preeminence of this throne, because it's a great throne. The word great in the Greek is actually the word megos. I'm sure it's great in its size. We don't have the dimensions. We don't have the height. But this is a great throne. You know, the Bible's full of great things. In Ephesians, Paul talks about the great love of God. And if you're in this meeting tonight, dear sinner, no matter who you are, where you are, what you've done, no matter how bad your past, I want to tell you that God has great love for you. But you see, in this day, the great love is gone. The Bible talks of great great mercy. And if you come to the Lord Jesus Christ tonight, if you come as a hell-deserving sinner to the foot of the old rugged cross, I'll tell you what you'll find there. Mercy. Mercy. In Psalm 77, the Bible tells us that there's coming a day when mercy will be clean gone forever. And that's this day. The Bible talks about great grace. In Psalm 77 again, it also says it's coming a day when God has forgotten to be gracious. And that's this day. It talks about a great pardon, a great deliverance, a great salvation, a great shepherd. But you see, this day, dear friend, if you ever die in your sin and you stand before this throne, great love will be gone, great grace will be gone, great mercy will be gone, great salvation will be gone, the opportunity of great deliverance and the great ransom will be gone. It'll all be gone. 
This is the day of great judgment. This is the day of the great white throne. There's not only the preeminence of this throne, there's the purity of this throne because it's a great white throne. White speaks of purity and holiness. And that shows me that this one that's going to sit upon this throne, this judge cannot be bought, he cannot be bribed, he cannot be bargained with. You know, every judge that stands or sits upon a, on the court, no matter how good he is at his job, he always has a bend. There's always a bias in his thinking. But the day when men and women unconverted stand before the judge of the world, the judge of all the creation, the God of all glory, there's no bend, there's no bias, there's no error in his decision. He's uncompromising in his purity and holiness and righteousness. And it was on that very theme whenever Paul preached, it says that Felix trembled. He trembled. When, whenever Paul spoke of righteousness and judgment to come, Felix trembled. You see, dear unsaved in the meeting tonight, I ought to see you tremble in this very seat tonight, that you would tremble under the impending judgment of a holy God that knows all your thoughts and words and doing. Oh, it's a, it's a white throne. But there's not only the preeminence and the purity, there's power here. Because this is not a courtroom. I'm not bringing you tonight into a court. I'm not bringing you before one another. There's no jury here. There's no attorney here. There's no barristers here. There's no QCs here. There's no bail. There's no, no appeal. There's no probation. There's no judicial review. The judgment is final. There's no defense. No, there's no courtroom here. This is a throne room. A throne but you know, as John, I think he got his eyes past the preeminence of this throne. And I think he got his eyes past even the very purity and past the power and authority of it. And I think he got his eyes onto the person that was on the throne. You cast your eye again to verse 11, and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it. This is God's throne. You cast your eye to the verse 12 and you'll see that it was they stood before God. We heard that this morning. What an awesome thing it is to stand in the high court of a land. What an awesome thing it would be to be brought before the European Court of Council. But I tell you, dear sinner, in this meeting tonight that has covered your, covered your sin with religion and you've even ignored and denied the gospel and forsaken Christ, I want to tell you on this day, when you stand not before a man, not before a magistrate, not before a lawyer, to stand naked, uncovered, be, before God. What a day. It's God's throne. I'll go even more specific than that. Because the Bible said, and the Lord Jesus said in John 5, that the Father judgeth no man. He hath committed all judgment unto the Son. And the one upon the throne, this, this one that's going to be seated upon the throne, is none other than the, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. But on this day, he's not the Savior anymore. On this day, he's not the substitute anymore. On this day, he's not the great shepherd anymore. He's seated upon the throne in all of his splendor, majesty, power, and authority. You cast your eye to verse 11 again. It says, from whose face the earth and the heavens, they fled away. Do you remember that face? You remember whenever Mary gave birth to that little baby boy, there was many days in the, in the life of Mary that she washed the face of the Savior. You remember the face whenever the Lord Jesus took Peter, James, and John and went up into the Mount of Transfiguration and it says his face, it shone with glory. 
In Matthew 26, it says that he, he went a little further and he fell on his face. And it was there where he agonized in prayer alone before the Father in anticipation of all of the agonies of Calvary. It was that very face that they spat upon. It was that very face that they plucked the very cheeks from. It was that face that was so marred more than any man. It's that face that the very earth and the heavens flee away from. In Revelation chapter 6, it tells us there that the kings of the earth and the great men and every rich man and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks and called upon the mountains. And this is what they said, Hide us from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. And dear unsaved in the meeting tonight, you can live whatever way you want. You can do all that you plan to do. You can make all of the decisions down here. But whenever you die and whenever you stand before him, whenever heaven and earth is not permitted even to be there, and you stand alone before him, nowhere to hide, there's nowhere to run, you'll discover this, that every gospel message that you ever heard, it was right. Every time that your mother and father pleaded with you to get saved and you thought they were fools, on that day you'll discover they were right. And to see the face of him that sat upon the throne. What a vision. But there's not only the vision of this throne, I want you to think for a moment of the venue of this throne. Because the heavens and the earth, they flee away. God just bumps them all out of the way. The earth is gone. The heavens are gone. Time is gone. Out into eternity. You maybe haven't made any room for God in your life, sir. And you've maybe had all of your business plans and all of your ambitions and all of your desires and you've, you're like the innkeeper. You have no room for him tonight. But oh, to get a grasp of this, there's coming a day when God will make room for you. He's just going to bump the heavens and the earth out of the way and it'll be the great eternity at the great white throne. Time will be gone. The heavens and the stellar earth, the stellar heavens will be gone. The earth will be gone. Your hiding place will be gone. Your church will be gone. Your good works will be gone. Your money and all of your possessions, your lovely car, your lovely clothes, all your jewelry and necklaces, and all your prestige, popularity and fame, on that day as you stand alone will be gone. The excuses will be gone. The opportunities will be gone to stand there before the great white throne judgment seat and see the face of him that sat upon the throne from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away. And while they, as I said, were, they were permitted to go, you're not permitted to move. You have to stay with nowhere to hide, with nowhere to run. Just alone with God. Ah, oh, you maybe didn't think a day like this was coming. You maybe thought there was no day of accountability that you could lie and sin and indulge yourself in all of the sin that you want. And you thought that you could get away with it. But dear friends, let me tell you, the Bible says, shall not the judge of earth do that which is right? There's not only the venue of the throne, and there's not only the vision of the throne. I want you to think for a moment tonight of the variety that's before the throne. It says in verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. One of the translations of that in the Greek has it like this, I saw the dead, the small ones, and the great ones. And you know, if I was maybe to talk to you tonight after the meeting, you would say, well, Stephen, you know, I'm really a nobody. I, I'm a humble sort of a person. Maybe you're going to be a small one on this day. 
Maybe there's a businessman here and you would start to talk to me about all of your dealings and all of, your, all, all of the great enterprise that you've built up. Maybe on this day you'll be one of the great ones. But John said, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, the sinner's last stand. You see, after this day, there's nowhere to put your feet. There'll be no substance be below your feet after this day. And we're going to see as we close, because there's a bottomless pit. And your feet will never stand again on solid ground. This will be the sinner's last stand. It's not a stand of defiance. And maybe even in this very meeting tonight, inside your soul, you're resisting and you're defying God. And I want to tell you in this day, it'll not be a stand of defiance. You'll not stamp your feet. You'll not clench your fist. It'll be a stand of reverence before a holy, almighty, omnipotent God. And they stood before him. Every sinner from Adam to the end of time. Every man and woman, boy, girl that died without Christ. Went out into eternity unprepared, unborn again. Never had an encounter with the living God. Oh, they may have been good. They may have been nice. They may even have been Protestants or Presbyterians. But they died without Christ. The dead. Small and great. John said, I saw them. And I was thinking during the week, I wondered whenever John was looking, did he see a young man there? The young man that one day came to the Lord and it says that he was running. And it says that he came and he knelt before the Lord. Mark tells us that he was rich. Matthew tells us that he was young. He was the rich young ruler. And the Lord Jesus had a conversation with him about the things of eternity. And it says that the rich young ruler went away being sorrowful. He'll be here. I wonder, did John see him? I wonder, did John see Lot's wife there? That woman that was almost saved, that woman, that divine angelic power laid, her, laid their hands upon her and tried to bring her out of the place of danger into the place of safety, just like God has done with you, mother, for many, many a time. And it says that Mrs. Lot, Lot she looked back and she perished. I wonder, did John catch her eye that day? I wonder, did John see Judas there? The one that was with the Lord three and a half years, the man that kept the bag, the man that seen miracles, the man that seen the dead raised, the man that heard the greatest sermon ever preached, the man that was with the Lord and his company, the man that sold Christ for 30 pieces of silver. What are you selling them for tonight? Now Judas will be there. What about the un unrepentant thief? While there was one turned to Christ, the other one, he reviled him and mocked him and despised him. And just a few hours later, he was out and he turned it. He'll be here. Pilate will be there. That man that thought he could wash the, the, the responsibility of Christ away, he didn't want to deal with the Lord. He said, uh, I'll get a basin of water. I'll pass the responsibility on to someone else. I don't want to make this decision. Pilate will be there. You see, dear friends, tonight every time that you hear the gospel, God pushes you for a response. Pilate made the wrong one. Felix will be there. Agrippa will be there. Almost I persuadest me to be a Christian. Almost but lost. I want to ask you a question tonight. Mother, will you be there? Young man, will you be there? Your mother will not be there. She's saved. Your father may not be there. He may be saved. But if you die in your sin and if you took a heart attack before I come off this very pulpit, I tell you there's coming a day whenever you'll be there. When the dead, small and great stand before God. What a company. What a tragedy. 
The religious will be there. The atheist will be there. The rich and the poor. Black and the white. The well-known and the unknown. The old and the young. The educated, the illiterate. The small and the great. There'll be Protestants there. There'll be Catholics there. There'll be preachers there. There'll be politicians there. There'll be priests there. Will you be there? Hitler will be there. Nero will be there. What about you tonight? I wonder whenever John was penning this almost 2,000 years ago, I wonder whenever he said, I saw the dead ones, the small ones, the great ones stand before God. I wonder, did he see you there? I've never seen that person before, but someday they'll obviously be on planet earth and they'll die without Christ and I can see them there. You know, dear friends, the reason why they're there. It's not because they were bad. It's not because they murdered someone. The reason why they were there is the very same reason that you could be there. It's because they didn't deal with sin. Oh, they maybe heard the gospel and they maybe heard in the missions and they maybe received tracts and they maybe heard the open airs and they maybe read the billboards and they maybe denied the gospel. They maybe even ignored it or rejected it or maybe they just neglected it and said some other day. And they died without Christ. The first list of people that's going to be there in that day, don't turn to it, but the next chapter in verse 8, it says the fearful will be there and the unbelieving will be there. Are you afraid to get saved? You're afraid of what men will say or what your wife or what your parents will say. Will you top the list on this day? And then it goes on and it says the abominable and the whoremongers and the idolaters. But the very first was the fearful and the unbelieving. Ah, you maybe said to me, Stephen, I don't believe it. But let me tell you, dear friends, tonight God will allow you to make that, that choice. But there's coming a day whenever you will stand before him and there'll be no atheists or agnostics that day. I tell you, dear friends, tonight this is God that we're dealing with. The creator, the one that had no beginning, the one that will never have an end. To stand before God. The sea gave up the dead which were in it. The grave gave up the dead which were in it. And hell gave up the dead which were in it. And this is going to be a great resurrection day. Oh, the saints will already be in heaven. But there's coming a day whenever all the unsaved from Adam to the end of time, their body will rise out of the dust. Those that died in the Titanic will rise. Those that died in the Spanish Armada way out in the Pacific, they'll rise. Those planes that went down away out in the Atlantic, their bodies will rise uh, from the graves, from the mass graves, maybe even in Ukraine. The grave in Dunyan and the grave in your own town, there'll be, the body will come up and their soul will come out of Hades, out of hell. And they'll be reunited on that day and stand before God. And let me tell you, dear sinner, this, get this into your mind because it has shook me. Do you see the very body that you have now? That's the very body that you will stand before him on this day. You look at your hands, those hands will see him. Those eyes of yours will see him. And your soul will come out of hell if you die tonight. You'll go down into a disembodied state. Your body will be laid in the grave. But there's coming a day when your body and soul will stand before God. The very body that you send in. 
the very body that you use as an instrument to defy and disobey and rebel against God, I say to you, will stand before him whether you bury it or burn it or cremate it, whether you're drowned out of the sea and out of the grave, and they'll stand before God. In the piercing eyes of fire, the one who out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword, the one whose countenance is as the sun shining in his strength, the one whose voice is as the sound of many waters, he's the one that'll do all the talking and not they. You never read of an unsaved man arguing here. But there's not only the venue of the throne and the vision of the throne. Let me talk to you for a moment about the volumes that are at the throne. Because John, he went on and he said in verse 12, he said, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were opened. There's going to be volumes of books there. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. The Bible will be there. You know that book that you have at home that you never took time to read? That book will be there. The books of the law will be there. The books of the deeds of your life will be there. Every word ever spoken. Every lie ever told, every thought that ever penetrated your mind, every action and every motive and every deed, all of your adultery will be recorded. All of your shady dealings, all of your backhanders will be there. Every time that you took God's name in vain, it's penned down in heaven. Every time that you stole from your employer, there was a scribe in heaven wrote it down. And all the deeds and words and thoughts and doings of your life will be unraveled before you. Be sure your sin will find you out. I think there's going to be a book there. It'll be the book of opportunities will be there. Times whenever you were heard the gospel, times whenever God maybe sent a man or woman to your area with a gospel mission or with a gospel track and pleaded with you to get saved and you, you said, not now, some other day, and there was a scribe in heaven penned down that opportunity that you missed every message that you ever heard. Every time there's a preacher pleaded with you in the pulpit to get saved, it'll be all brought before you. Every track that you ever received and ripped up and threw in the street will be there. All the times that God spoke to you, sir, will be penned down. But there's not only going to be the books of the deeds in the Bible, I believe, will be there in the book of opportunities. I think there'll be a book that'll be called the book of privileges will be there. Do you tell me that a man that dies in Africa that has never heard the gospel will get the same punishment that you'll get? Brought up in Ulster. Verses everywhere. Missions everywhere. I tell you, dear friends, there's degrees of punishment in hell. And that's why every man was judged according to his work. To stand before God with no argument. The psychologists tell us that there's an unconscious area in your mind that can recall everything that you've done from the age of understanding. And on that day, all of these deeds will be brought before you and God will say, you did that and you'll have to say, I remember doing that. I remember whenever you spoke to me, Lord, but I pushed it off. I didn't do anything about it. The Lord Jesus said, nothing shall be covered that shall not be revealed, and nothing is hidden that shall not be made known. And dear unsaved in the meeting tonight, let me tell you whatever secrets you have. God shall judge all the secrets of men. Romans chapter 2 and verse 16. And then there's another book there. 
which is the book of life. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And that tells me that if they weren't found, they were looked for. And on that day, dear friends, whenever you are standing before him and you discover that God was willing to save you and God was real and this was reality, that there was a heaven and there is a hell and the gospel was the only means of salvation and you spurned the grace of God on that day, your name will be searched for in the book of life and whosoever's name was not found, not found, was cast into the lake of fire. Oh, you maybe had your name on a church roll. You maybe had your name in the, uh, the register of some secret society or some lodge or some club, but you never took time to get your name in the, the book of life. The only place where it counts. But you know, there's not only and finally the vision of the throne and there's not only the venue of it and the variety before it and the volumes added. There's the verdict from it. For whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. It's a literal fire. It's a physical fire. It's not only literal and physical, I'll tell you it's final and it's eternal and it's unescapable. In verse 10 it says it's a fire of brimstone that shall torment forever and forever and forever and forever and ever. It's a lake without a bottom. It's a fire without an end, a torment without relief, an eternity without a hope, and it's a night without a day. For it's called outer darkness. And Judy says that they will suffer the vengeance of eternal fire. It's a fearful thing, you know, mother, to fall into the hands of a holy God. And if you die the way you are now, that's where you're going to go. Body, soul, and spirit. And that really grasped me even this morning, that this is not just a story, friends. That very body that you have at the moment will be in this very place. The physical hands that you have, the physical head that you have, Reach down and feel your legs. Let me tell you, those legs, if you don't get saved, will feel the flames of a lost lake of fire. Lost for all of eternity. There'll be tears there. There'll be death there. There'll be sorrow there. There'll be pain there. And I ask you again, dear friend, will you be there? There was an Irish evangelist over in England and he was living in a little gypsy Caravan, the old wooden ones. Doing a few missions down through the middle of England. And three little girls who were in the village, they came over to him and they pretended that he was a, a traveler and they, they were making fun of the gospel. Even though there was verses on the side of the caravan, they, they knocked one day in the caravan door and he opened the door and he says, how can I help you? And they says, we want you to read, tell us our fortune. He says, come on in. And those three little girls, they were all sniggering as they went in. They thought that they'd got this evangelist. They thought they were going to make a fool of him. And he seized the opportunity. He says, young girls, sit down for a moment. Open your hands. And he got their little hands and he rubbed their hands. And he says, oh, I can see what's coming. He says, open your eyes. And he looked into their eyes. He says, I can see your future. He says, open your mouth. And he pulled out their tongue and he says, oh, I can see it now. He says, lift, lift the legs of your trousers. And he, he says, let me see your knees. And they rolled up their wee trousers, their wee half trousers. And they said, let me see your knees. And he says, oh, I can see it. He says, there's coming a day when your eyes will see the face of him that sitteth on the throne. There's coming a day when your hands, your hands will be lifted high with no defense. There's coming a day when your tongue will confess and your knees will bow that Jesus Christ his Lord. And those three little girls, they ran out and they went home, but thank God they were big enough and wise enough to come back and they got saved. Mm -hmm. Oh, I tell you, friends, there'll be millions there. You just stop now just for a moment. 
And I'll tell you of one way, the only way to escape this place. Because I can tell you outside Jerusalem on an old rugged cross on the hill of Calvary, there was one who took your pain. There is one who took your eternal punishment. There was one that became accountable for your sin. There was one that bore your burden in his own body on the tree. And he suffered and satisfied the wrath of God in full. That if you come to him tonight honestly, sincerely before him and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Your son died for me. He'll save you in the very seat where you sit. He said, I am the way, the truth and the life. Job could say, lay your hands on him, remember the battle, and do no more. And I tell you, dear friends, tonight, if you want to evade this place, if you want to escape this place, I want to tell you that you lay your hands by faith on the Son of God, who in the cross of Calvary bare our sins in his own body on the tree, and you lay your hands on him. Remember the battle, because I tell you on Calvary it was some battle, but then it says, do no more. You don't need to pay for it. You don't need to work for it. You'll need nothing less and you need nothing more. And the Lord said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth in him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. And at this very moment, you're still on the track to destruction. At this very moment, you're on your way to a lost sinner's hell. And if you died now, your body would be laid in the cemetery. Your soul will go down to the place where the rich, young, the rich, the rich man of Luke 16 is. But I tell you, there's coming a day when your body will come come out of the grave and your soul will come out of hell and you'll stand before the great white throne alone with no defense, no barrister, no jury and you'll stand regal before him. And you'll say, oh my God. It was all true. And I've played the fool with God. Robert Ingersoll was one of the greatest orders in America in the 1800s. He was nicknamed the great agnostic. He spent all his time and invested all of his money in disproving the reality of God and mocking the necessity of salvation. And shortly before his death, Robert Ingersoll, there was a minister of the gospel, came to him, and this is what he said. He said, Mr. Ingersoll, where do you expect to go when you die? Ingersoll said, I expect to go to hell. Would you not prefer to go to heaven? The minister pleaded. He said, no, I would not be happy there. And the minister went on in his earnestness and he said, in spite of all of your sins, sir, there is one who died for you. There is one who shed his blood that you could be forgiven. He took your punishment. He bore your sin. He satisfied the wrath of God. There's a way that you can have your sins forgiven. Peace with God and a home in heaven. You can be saved by the grace of God. And Ingersoll said, I don't want to be saved. I want to live my own life. I want to die my own death. And I want to bear whatever consequences follow that. Let me tell you, dear friends, the great agnostic died in his sin. But there's coming a day when Robert Ingersoll, the great orator, the great agnostic, will stand before the great white throne judgment seat on the great judgment day. And his name will not be found in the book of life and he'll be cast into the lake of fire. I wonder, will you be standing beside him? I wonder, will you be there? Now just stop for a little moment. Tonight. There may be a young man in this meeting tonight and your mother has pleaded with you for years, son, to get saved, and you haven't done it. You could end up like Ingersoll. And your eyes will see us, and your tongue will confess, and your knees will bow, and after it all, you'll be cast out into the lake of fire, where there's weeping, and wailing, 
and gnashing of teeth. And always remember this, it's the very body that you're in tonight for all of eternity.